Presenting by Rafael, uh, let me take the opportunity to thank again uh, Dana, Yael and Vinod for uh, hosting this event and for arranging such a wonderful uh, program. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Rafael Pass. Uh, Rafael completed his graduate uh, studies here in uh, MIT uh, with uh, Silvio Micali a few years ago, right? And um, he's done a fundamental uh, uh, work on various and a larger way of uh, topics, including normal ability, concurrency, uh, zero knowledge, multi-party uh, computation, uh, more recently blockchain, and more broadly is working uh, on the interplay of uh, cryptography and uh, things like uh, complexity theory and um, game theory. And today he's going to tell us about this uh, very exciting and very fruitful uh, line of works that tries to uh, um, study or understand the relation between cryptography and the uh, problems in uh, meta complexity. So, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Perry, and thank you so much for the organizers for inviting me. As you heard, this is going to be a talk about uh, cryptography and the Kolmogo complexity, and this is a joint work with Yanyi, who is there. All this, uh, this uh, line of work is all based uh, on work with Yanyi. Uh, so as, uh, as Benny has explained, uh, I got my PhD here with Silvio, and Silvio has told me you can never have two introductions for a talk. So since I'm going to have two introductions, I thought I might as well have also two title slides to make it even worse, <clears throat> given what I learned yesterday from Dakshita's talk. So since we live in the era of Ponzi schemes, I thought, you know, we're early on, there's a very distinguished group of people uh, on this list making Match Made in Heaven uh, connections. I thought I want to get in on this early on before it's too late. So I'd like to argue that the real Match in Heaven was actually between cryptography and Kolmogor complexity. It seems that cryptography had a good time in heaven. Uh, with a lot of uh, dating. <laughs> uh, all right, so I have another little disclaimer here. Um, the type of cryptography I'm going to talk about is actually not information theoretic at all. I'm going to talk only about computational cryptography. And I have two explanations for why that is okay. The first one is because Dana asked me to talk about this line of work. So therefore, <laughs> That's what I'm doing. And uh, the second one is that uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about Kolmogor complexity shortly. But Kolmogor complexity is a subject that is uh, studied uh, in a field called uh, algorithmic information theory. So it really is a very information theoretic uh, concept. And I'll try to argue actually that computational cryptography and this notion of algorithmic information theory are very, very, very closely related. You know, the one take home from, uh, There's somebody else talking on the Zoom. So the main take home here is actually that if you study computational cryptography, that is totally fine and you can still submit your papers to ITC because it really is all about algorithmic information theory. You can continue. I can Sorry, All right. Everybody. So um, let me start off by summarizing computational cryptography for the last 2,000 years, given to at ITC. So more or less, this is the way crypto proceeded. I'm also getting a lot of... Can you hear me okay? Uh, this is roughly how computational cryptography has proceeded for the last 2,000 years. We have some artist that invents some scheme, maybe claims or maybe even proves that known attacks fail on this scheme. The scheme gets deployed. Once it gets deployed in critical situations, eventually it gets broken by some attacker. And at that point, we have to either patch the scheme or find a new artist, uh, sometimes kill the previous one because he made a mistake. What can you do? And you move on. <clears throat> Uh, and this is the way cryptography really proceeded for a very long time until we uh, came to the age of enlightenment that came a little bit later for cryptographers. We had to wait until the 70s to reach enlightenment. And uh, it was through the work of Diffie and Hellman from 1976, which is the year I was born also, 
uh, they define this notion of a one-in function. So one of the goals of their super influential paper was to kind of find an object that kind of seemed like it was minimal for cryptography. And it seemed that this notion of one-in function was to them. So what's a one-in function? Most of you probably know it. It's a function that's easy to compute. So given a random input x, I can compute f of x efficiently in polynomial time. But given f of x, it's hard to go back. It's hard to recover x. Okay, the most classic example is multiplication. It's very easy to multiply large numbers. But if I give you the product of two large numbers, it's very hard to find the factors, we believe. Okay. So the formal definition, if you haven't seen it, it's a polynomial time computer function, such that for every probabilistic polynomial time attacker A, there exists a negligible function, uh, such that attacker, given a random string uh, X, apply the function to random string, give F of X to the attacker, the probability that he finds any pre-image should be negligible. Yeah. yeah. Everything I'll talk about extends also. In fact, some of the res results that we'll discuss actually only work for that. But most of the things I'll talk about today works for, uh, for both. Okay. So Diffie and Hellman kind of argued informally that this seems to be like a minimal thing that we need. And they also show that in some type of applications, this is also actually what you want on a high level. And since then, over the last four decades, Kind of amazing, their vision just turned out to be completely right. It was like a prophecy, I think, right? So they introduced this thing, said it seems to be the minimal thing, seems to also be sufficient. And some of these results are very complicated to get, but it turned out that one in functions are not only necessary, but also are sufficient for lots of the things that we need in cryptography, like private encryption, pseudonym generators, digital signatures, authentication schemes, PRFs, commitments, coin tossing, and so on and so forth. So for a lot of the things that we uh, use as cryptographers, and a lot of the things are actually powering the- <laughs> Or at least a parking spot. <laughs> <laughs> Can you guys mute yourselves? I may have done that comparison not so many years ago. <laughs> no, we should expect huge- 17? <laughs> Can't see anybody else. Maybe it was one of the, the authors. <laughs> So one of the functions actually turned out to be that's exactly thing that we, that we need for uh, all these tasks. Now, these tasks, of course, don't include everything we know how to do with cryptography today. Uh, public encryption is uh, probably the most famous example that we don't know how to get from one of the functions. Uh, oblivious transfer and more recent obfuscations. There are lots of things that, uh, and the obfuscation is not even clear that it's, it implies one of the functions. So, uh, I'm not going to talk about these more advanced things. I'm going to stay in, in this regime. OK. So it's safe to say that whether one-way functions exist is the most important problem in computational cryptography. Maybe not in information theoretic, but when I say non-trivial cryptography, I really mean these things today. Okay. And obviously, as you know from this conference, there are lots of very cool things you can do information theoretically. That's not going to be my focus. Right? My focus on this. And if you want to do all these things, and these are really the things that are powering into it today, uh, we need one-way functions. So the question is, do they exist? And uh, so Diffin and Hellman had something to say about that also. They observed that it's not going to be so easy to show the existence of one in functions because one in functions implies that NP is uh, not equal to P. In fact, NP is not inside BPP. So that's trivial because if you have a, uh, if you can solve NP, you can easily find a, a pre-image. Okay. So, the next best thing they thought was, OK, you know, it seems like this implies MP not equal to P. Maybe we can assume that MP is not equal to P, MP is not inside BP, and then we get the one in function. OK, so that was one of the suggestions they had. Uh, that is something that we today call the holy grail. We have not been able to do that. That would be amazing. That would be based in crypto and kind of the, really the, the weakest uh, uh, type of assumption. And uh, it's still unknown whether we can base one of functions on NP, notice that BP. Uh, 
there's been uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, work, or actually not as much as, as there should be, on trying to show that this is going to be hard. So there's a bunch of separations, trying to argue that it's actually going to be hard to get one in functions from MP not inside BPP. I would like to actually point out here that all these separations, even when they're restricted to black box, which they all are, they don't even, we don't even know how to rule out all black box uh, reductions for this task. Even for that, it's very, very partial. Uh, it's black box operations that are very restricted in various different unnatural ways. So this question is actually wide open even to get the black box separation between one of functions and MP not equal to P. Okay, so in the absence of this holy grail, what do we do? Because we want to use one of functions. Well, we have a bunch of candidates, right? So cryptographers, since Stephen Hellman, have come up with a bunch of candidates. Like the factoring or the discrete logarithm problem uh, that uh, came from different handmol already. Uh, more recently, we have these uh, amazing lattice problems, and then there are more uh, kind of heuristic style uh, functions like DS, SHA, and AS. Uh, so far, they're not broken, but uh, like Silvio said, as quoted by Joe Killian in an 88 paper, cryptographers seldom sleep well at night. Killian's interpretation of this was that uh, Silvio is worried that uh, factor is going to be broken one day. You know, there might be other reasons why cryptographers don't sleep well at night, but let's <laughs> stick, to, stick to this interpretation. Uh, why? Well, you know, any day we wake up, this thing might be broken. And indeed, if quantum computers get built and they're becoming better and better now, then we know that both factor and discrete log problems could be broken in polynomial time, and then those things are dead. Like we, quantum computers are still not breaking lattices, but they have only been there for a few decades. So who knows? You know, maybe we start there, but maybe they will break those things also. So, uh, so we have somehow escaped from this vicious crypto cycle we're in this cat and mouse game in a sense that we are now managing to build these big castles of much more advanced objects starting from one in functions. But when it comes to one in functions, we're still stuck in this kind of experimentation uh, approach where we come up with candidates and we just try to break them. Once they get broken, we have to flip them for something else. So we have, like, have a very good foundation starting from one in functions and building upwards. But in terms of one in functions, we don't really have a, a great theoretical foundations for why these things ought to be secure. Okay, there are, clearly, there are some very nice information theoretic algebraic models to analyze why some of these things may be secure, but it's, uh, it's not clear whether those actually uh, capture all types of attacks. So the problem that we're going to be addressing here is that there exists some natural problem that is kind of complete for one in functions. A problem that has the property that if one in functions exist and this problem is hard, and if this problem is hard, then one in functions actually uh, exist. Okay, so let's say that factoring had that property. But in that case, we should just focus all our attention on trying to factor in polynomial time. And if nobody managed to factor, then we know that we have you know, uh, uh, good crypto. And if people manage to factor, then we can only for, then forget about the normal crypto. Let's just focus on ITC. Okay. And so that's what we're looking for. And uh, Leonard Levin, in fact, had a very nice such uh, approach. So he came up with something he called a universal one in function, which was a one in function that has the property that if this function uh, can be broken, then no one in functions can exist. So it was a universal, a complete one in function. The only problem is, and that's why I'm calling it partial, and, uh, is that this function was not, it wasn't a natural problem. It was a function that was really tailored to this task based on enumeration. So it's not really clear if this problem gives us an insight into whether one in functions exist. What we're looking for is a, is a problem like something like factoring or discrete, something natural, something that was defined independently of ideally uh, cryptography, All right? Factoring would be great because it's been around for 2000 years. And so we would like, like something like that. 
Uh, so that is uh, something we do in the first paper. It's not as good as factoring that's been around for thousands of years. But uh, what we show is that there exists a complete problem for any functions. And that is the t bounded Comorgo complexity problem. Okay, so the main theorem is going to be for every polynomial t greater than, let's say, 1.1n, one in functions exists if and only if this t bundle Comorgo complexity problem is mildly hard on average. Yeah, because factoring implies one in functions, which imply which is equivalent to this. So this one is, you know, it's if and only if, so clearly, yeah. No, Levin's function has a similar state, which is a Levin's function is not a problem. Like Levin's function is a very artificial type problem. Right? He defines a function that is, you know, that function, if that function is one way, then, uh, uh, well, if one function exists, then there is one way. And uh, uh, if that can be broken, then all one functions can be broken. Okay, but it's not, a, it's not a problem that was interesting in its own right. So what we're looking for is a problem that's, that's interesting in its own right, the characters of one functions. Ideally something that exists. No, 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 Levin actually in his paper is very clear about this thing. He says like, he's very apologetic. He explains like, this is a very artificial thing. What we want is a natural problem, actually. He himself actually called it like a, a partial uh, solution. Um, okay, so I'm gonna tell you now switching gears. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what this problem is. Uh, so it turns out that like the reason I would call this a natural problem is that this problem actually has been around longer than it, it was defined before Diffie-Hellman's uh, paper on one-way functions. In fact, to a large extent it was defined before the whole theory of empty completeness. So it's a problem that dates back to the 60s. All right, so before telling you more about what this problem is, let me just, tell you what Kolmorgo complexity is. So Kolmorgo complexity is trying to uh, help us answer questions like this. So you have two strings on the slide here. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and that one is 170, blah, blah, blah. Okay, which of them is more random? Now, clearly, by just looking at it, the first one doesn't look very random, and the second one looks better. And indeed, the way I generated it was like tapping on my keyboard. Okay, but how do we, you know, we can see it, but how, how can we formulate such a statement? And typically we're used to quantifying randomness of distributions, but not of individual strings when they're just written down. You know, maybe I also got this by tapping at random on my keyboard. It could happen, right? With the same probability as that, actually. So, uh, so Conmogo complexity is an amazing way of actually formalizing a statement like this. And it does it as follows. So we say that the Kolmogorov complexity of a string x, we define it as the length of the shortest program that outputs a string x. And then we'll say that strings that have large Kolmogorov complexity, they are random, and things that have small Kolmogorov complexity are not random. Okay, make sense? But this depends on the programming thing. Right. Yes, so this is very program language dependent. So uh, for now, you know, fix whatever program language that you prefer and think of that in your mind, okay? We'll discuss this issue a little bit more later on because there's clearly, this is a contentious point and thus some people hate Kolmogorov complexity because of that, because it's not, you know, it depends on program language. We'll discuss a little bit more. So there are, there are ways around this issue. Okay, and so the reason I have this model box set here is that this is a, a classic example of something that like looks very complicated. It looks like this thing, right? But actually it has a very, very short description. A few lines of code can generate this picture. Okay, so it's something a priori uh, seems very complicated, but actually has, is not random at all. Okay, so to deal with your question formally, we need to fix some Turing machine or programming language and we're looking for the length of the shortest program such that uh, the universal Turing machine when you're given program M and some inputs outputs the string W. Okay, but if you don't want to think about universal Turing machines, think of Python. Everything works also. 
Comorgo Complex has lots of amazing applications uh, in uh, uh, in logic, as in the most elegant proof of Gull's incompleteness theorem. This was by Shaitin. Uh, that's why he actually uh, introduced this notion of Comorgo uh, complexity in his uh, paper in the penalty of Comorgo. Uh, was to prove uh, provide a different proof of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Uh, it has applications in pure math, like for proofs of uh, the density of primes, and, and lots of other really cool applications. But it's not computable. Okay, so this is giving a string. You can there is no program that outputs this thing. Okay, this is good if you want to prove an incompleteness theorem. That's actually the whole reason why uh, this notion is useful there. But it's not good if you would like to like actually use it in practice for something. So this was something that Conmogor had already noticed in the, in the 60s. And uh, so he said, we really also need to consider a time-bounded notion of Conmogor complexity, which is defined in exactly the same way, except that I'm, I'm going to restrict the running time of the program to some polynomial t. Okay. I think back then they considered t being like n square or n cube. And for, you know, for the rest of the talk, you can just think of t being n square. Does that make sense? So I'm looking at the short, I'm looking for the shortest program with running time n square or bounded by n square to output string. And now suddenly, this is actually computable. Right, it's easy to see you can, uh, you can compute it because you can just enumerate over all possible programs. The program is never going to be, there's a simple statement that we're going to rely on later on, that the length of the biggest program is never going to be much longer than a string because you can always consider a program just like print and hard codes the string. Okay? So now when you know that the length of the shortest program is at most n plus some constant, you can just enumerate over all possible programs, requires exponential time, and then you run them up until n squared time, and you check if you can output it and you find the smallest one. Okay, so it's computable, but it takes, that requires exponential time. Right, it requires two to the n times uh, t of n. And so a question that was studied starting from the 60s in the Soviet Union is whether you can efficiently compute it. And indeed, back then, they had this conjecture. They felt that this is a great problem that, that we believe requires uh, brute force search. And this is today referred as to the parabolic conjecture. Yeah, we believe that this requires actually, there's no better method than just enumerating overall programs. So that was done in the Soviet Union that independently, Yuris Hagmanis, Mike Sipser and co uh, uh, in the eighties started studying this problem also. And uh, this problem is actually closely related to uh, something called the minimum circuit size problem, uh, which you can think of as a circuit version of, uh, of this, where you're not considering two machines based at circuits and more generally falls within a general uh, area of uh, research that, that's called meta-complexity. It's uh, the, the study of the complexity of the complexity of, uh, of something. I'm not gonna really talk much more about this today, but there is a whole uh, sub-branch of complexity theory studying these type of meta-complexity uh, questions. So instead of going more into, you know, context, let me just like kind of like emotionally uh, explain why you should care about this problem uh, on its own. So in a world where KT is easy, we can do great things. Like in particular, optimal compression of files is possible, right? Because especially if I can not only just determine the global complexity, but also find the program that does it, because that's exactly what it does. Okay, great. We'll be able to have like uh, PK zip that's like twice as good as we have today, you know? For some application, that's good, maybe not so. So I would like to argue that this is actually much more fundamental than that. And this is a little bit hand wavy now, but bear with me. So I would like to argue that to some extent, science becomes easy if KT is easy. Okay. At least if you believe Occam's razor, and we don't really have many better foundations for science today than Occam's razor still. Okay, so what does Occam's razor say? It's an old principle from the 1200s. Uh, well, it says entities are not to be blah, blah, blah. Well, the easy way to understand, the, the Occam's razor way to understand Occam's razor is that if I have a bunch of data 
the truest explanation of this data is the simplest way to explain it. So the simplest explanation that generates this data, that's most likely the truest. That's basically what Occam's razor says. Okay. And so in the language of Komodo complex, that's exactly what we're looking for, right? We have some data, we're looking for the smallest way to generate it. If we get that, then we really have the best explanation for why this data, data was generated. So we, we get some, we see something uh, happening, the stock market is evolving. If I can get a short explanation of what happens with the stock market, that's the, probably the, the truest explanation for it. Okay, if you consider that science. Sorry? Uh, Polytime, uh, okay, so yes, if the universe is full of melt, you know, yes, this is the best we can do today, right? Uh, you could consider some quantum version of this also, of course, if you, but um, uh, so there is a little asterisk here. I don't mean actually science is completely easy, but it's easy in the same way as like, you know, if these AI robots are built that are optimal, then uh, there's still going to be the issue that we still need to get the data. So eventually we'll have all these like AIs that are doing this, all the intelligent stuff, and we're just the slaves that are collecting the data. That's what's going to be what scientists are used to. So there's still, there's still a use for us here. We'll just be the collectors of, yeah. Is if all you know, or if eventually the robots will be doing an as good approximation of KT as we can do. So the AIs will do that for us, yeah. Okay, so let's get back to uh, the, the theorem here. Uh, so what we're gonna talk about today is actually not worst case hardness of this problem, but average case hardness of this problem. And actually it's fascinating. If you go back to these uh, works from the sixties, they obviously didn't have a theory of average case hardness back then, but they considered something they called the frequential version of the question of Kolmogo complexity. So what is the frequential version of the question? So they were asking, does there exist an algorithm that maybe doesn't compute it always, but it computes it for a large fraction of inputs? That's exactly what we today call average case hardness, right? So for what fraction of the inputs can I compute KT? What fraction of strings? And a very simple observation was made in the sixties, was in fact that KT, you can compute it, uh, or at least you can, if you don't need to compute it exactly, but if you just need to have a log and approximation to KT, then you can do it for a large fraction of strings for one minus one over n fraction of strings. And what do you do? You just output n. Okay, so it's actually this question, at least as long as you just need to approximate it, it's not very strongly average case hard. It's only, well, it's, we believe only mildly average case hard. There is a simple way of doing it that gets one minus one over n, but we don't know how to do better than this. Okay, in fact, they were looking at the questions like, can we just improve this one minus one over n? And it seems like today there's still no approach that's better than brute force if you just want to beat this bound. All right, so let's define the classic notion of uh, mild average case hardness from complexity theory. So I'm going to define it just for KT. This is, but the definition clearly is uh, generalizes any function. But so we say that KT is mildly hard on average. If there exists some polynomial, think of n square here such that no PPT heuristic can compute KT with probability one minus one over uh, P of N. And so we know that polynomial cannot be just, P of N cannot be equal to N because you can do it, but there exists some polynomial. So let's say you cannot compute it better than one minus one over N squared. Okay, for infinity many N. So that's what it means for a function to be mildly hard on average. And then we can also extend it to say what it means for KT to be mildly hard on average for C approximate. Uh, then I don't require you to compute it exactly, but it's just that you can compute it within an additive term of C. Okay. Additive. Yeah, additive, additive, yes. Actually, it's not known how to deal with that uh, multiplicative. So additive, can you get C close additively to it? So here, for this thing, actually one could maybe assume that computing KT exactly uh, maybe one can beat this one around, like maybe one can get, maybe this is also hard, one minus one around. Okay, but add it, like if you want to get the approximation, uh, isn't it, I don't think it's exactly this. It's like, it's uh, X plus minus some constants. So you cannot like, 
You can maybe beat this a little bit, yeah. All right, so the main theorem now is the following three things are equivalent. One, if functions exist, number one, KT is mildly hard on average to compute exactly. And in fact, it's uh, mildly hard on average to C log and approximate for every, uh, every C. Okay, so correlation number one is just uh, the equivalence of one and two, that one if functions exist if and only if KT is mildly hard on average. And core number two is the fact that two and three are equivalent. This is a question that has nothing to do with cryptography. It just says that if KT is hard on average to C log and approximate, uh, sorry, if KT is mildly hard on average to compute exactly, then it's actually hard to approximate also. Okay. And so this is actually a long standing question in Comorgan complexity where approximating is easier than computing exactly. And from this whole cryptographic treatment, we directly get as a consequence that there is this uh, computing to approximating uh, reduction. So it's a quite intriguing use where like kind of cryptographic machineries turn out to be very useful to understanding this information theoretic uh, question. Any questions? Uh, Rafael, can I ask a question over Zoom? I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you perfectly. Okay. Um, so, uh, like, I, I just want to zoom out for a second, and I, I apologize. It's probably very naive, but uh, so one direction would be to to base existence of one way functions would be to say, I don't know, uh, on worst case hardness, right? Something you know, one way hardness. Oh, you know, if there is like you know, if p is not equal to n p, you have zero advances uh, in this direction, right? Just to check. So then my follow up question. So it looks like you're looking at the thing is like. One way functions exist if and only if discrete log is a one way function. Right? That would be kind of the direction that you're going to. But yet, you also have zero advances towards this, right? Because you're not giving us like a particular one way function, right? You're no, giving us I'll a, give you function. a function. I'll give you a concrete one way function, yeah, eventually. No, no, in, no, in the reduction, but I'm looking at the theorem statement, right? I understand maybe yes, the theorem I'll statement. Give you a particular one function, actually. Sorry? Yeah. And, and what Benny's answer. So first of all, I give you a particular one. And second of all, like Benny says, you can always do Levin if you want a particular one. But uh, I'll, I'll give you actually. But, but you're claiming that uh, I just wanted to answer. So you're saying I should interpret your statement that here is a natural particular one-way function that captures the heart of one-way functions. Is it correct interpretation of That's, your line of work? I don't think the one-way function itself is maybe that natural, but the problem that it's based on is very natural. So, so then it's not the right answer. Sorry, it's like, so yeah. you're not making advance on a natural one way function, so it's not a natural one way function. Like, really, yeah, nobody. So, so, so then uh, you think it's really uh, kind of one way function based on something which is in its own right natural or something? Yes, like that. That is the, that's how I would interpret it. Yeah. Is it, here's okay. a one way function. The one way function, you know, uh, we'll get to that. That's the main open problem getting a better one. Okay. okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so. Um, uh, Rafael, I had a question. This is Ron Canetti here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, can you explain just the qualifier, the quantifiers over T in the approximation statement? So. Oh, um, just, yeah, what, so what it, was it, what is this saying for every C and for every polynomial that's just, slightly super linear, not, in, not really super linear, but just like- I have a point here like that. Uh, if you want a C log approximation, uh, the, you're not, the mild Horner average guarantee is going to depend on the C here. Because there is always this trivial attack here. If you, don't, you, know, if you want to be log and close, you can do it one by log. If you want it two log and close, you can do it one, one over uh, N square. Uh, so, so it's for all C there exists a polynomial or something? Yeah, exactly. For all C, there exists a polynomial that uh, such, such, it's going to be hard for that. Okay, yeah, it's just uh, the, one of the quantifiers. Yeah, that yeah. So, for, so that mild hard, like mild hard average just says that there exists a polynomial, but this polynomial will depend on the C for an approximation. Right, okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, that's like it's necessary, right? Right, thanks. And I forget now if we were tight with respect to that, if uh, 
like ideally what you would like to show that if you beat the naive algorithm even by just like a little bit then you have uh, uh, one in functions I think we're not exactly there yet I don't remember any we've been discussing that many times but I forget if it's like if we're fully tight or not we're really close but not there yet yeah okay all right 20 okay so I have to okay um, so um, so we're not actually the first one to connect uh, this one in functions and, uh, and conmorgan complexity. Um, indeed, there are some connections going back to uh, work by Rasburg and Rudish, uh, uh, Cabaret and Kai and Allen et al. And they show that one in function, the existence of one in functions imply that KT is worst case hard. Okay, so this is going to be the starting point for us to later on show that K one in functions imply that KT is mildly hard on average. Uh, so this only this was a one-sided direction. We don't know one function is worst case order, but it wasn't know how they get from worst case order to one in functions actually. Uh, a recent work of Santanaman actually showed that uh, under new conjecture, then this related problem MCSP uh, is equivalent to one in function, but it required an additional conjecture. It was kind of a sophisticated conjecture. We still don't know if this, you know, if it's easy to prove this conjecture and proving the existence of one in functions directly. But at least, you know, he interpreted as saying that there is a strong connection between these notions, but it wasn't fully for us. All right, so uh, what I'm going to do now is just sketch a little bit the connection between one and two and just on a very, very high level, and then I'm going to go over some uh, more recent work. So direction number one, we want to show that if uh, KT is mildly hard on average and one in functions exist, this direct, this uh, is going to be the easier results. I'm going to try to go over it and almost give the whole thing here. Okay. And then that direction is that one of functions existing KT is hard on average. I'll just give a very, very high level sketch. Okay. So now the idea is actually to construct a one in function, assuming KT is hard. First observation is by the result of Yao, we don't need to construct a full fledged one in function. It suffices to get what's called a weak one in function. A weak one in function, think of that as a mild hard and average analog of a one in function. It's a function such that no PPT algorithm can invert it one minus one over P of n for some polynomial P of n. Okay, so you cannot do it better than one minus one over n squared. Okay, and if you get such a one in function, you can use parallel repetition to get a real one in function. Okay. So I'm going to give you a construction of this weak one in function. And here's what the construction is. Okay, so the first thing we need to uh, rely on is this observation I mentioned before, that given a string uh, x, the conmorgan complexity of x is never going to be much longer than the length of the string, let's call it n, plus some constant. This constant, let's say it's five for print. Okay, so print and then the string, that's, uh, that suffices to always uh, bound the conmorgan complexity. All right, so this is now what the one function will do. Given some input, I'm going to separate the input into two parts. One part, which is going to be of length n plus c. For now, just think of that as n, OK? And the second part is going to be roughly log n, OK? So the second part, i here, think of that as an index, index into the first part. OK, so you have the first part. And I'm going to think of the first part as a program. And the second part is this index. So what I will do now is take look at what this index is and cut off the first program after i bits. So you have this program first at n bits, and you cut it off to only i bits. And I'm going to call pi this new truncated program that's only i bits long. Make sense? So you take your input, cut it. Now you have an i bit program. Then just simply run this program for t of n steps and output whatever the program outputs, concatenated with the index. So that's the one in function. OK, so you take your input, truncate it to i steps, to, to i bits, interpret that as a program, run the program for t of n steps, and output the index and y. So it's a very simple function, very efficient, because you can set t here to be 1.1 n. So now it's like it's a linear time computable uh, function. And uh, now we need to argue that this is a weak one function. So to show that this is a weak one function, <clears throat> what we need to do 
is to say that if there exists some attack that breaks this one function, then I need to be able to uh, solve the Kolmogorov complexity problem with high probability, right? So assume for contradiction that exists some attacker that is able to invert it with probability one minus delta, where delta is the inverse of a, of a polynomial. And what I will show then is that we can actually come up with a heuristic that computes kt with probability one minus delta uh, times something, okay, order n. So it won't be able to do it with exact same probability, but very close times n. Okay, and that will be a contradiction, but that means that we can compute KT with high probability. Right? So if you can compute invert this win with high probability, you can compute KT with high probability, and we're done. So I need to tell you what the heuristic is. Okay. So let's just look at what happens if somebody is able to invert this thing. What do they do? Okay, so given the string y here, what is an inverse? An inverse is a program of length i that outputs the string y, right? So given a, an output i comma y, the inverse here actually is a program, well, it's pi prime, but pi prime truncated to pi is a program that generates a string. So it seems like, look, this is exactly what we want in order to determine Kolmogorov complexity, right? Just given a string y, how do I check the Kolmogorov complexity of it? Well, I just give the attacker y and one, y and two, y and three, and see if it outputs a program uh, that generates a string. Okay, so I just, you know, take this attacker and enumerate one comma y, two comma y, three comma y, and I pick the smallest i that will, uh, that, that this attacker actually outputs a program uh, that generates y. So it's trivial to see that if that attacker A succeeds with probability one, then this works, right? If it actually always inverts, then, you know, whenever I, uh, I set I to be the true Kolmogorov complexity, it will output a program that will generate it because there is such an inverse. Whenever I have an I that's smaller, it will not output a program to succeed because no such program exists. So I know that when Y is small, I is smaller, don't have to worry about that, okay? I don't care what, what it does. When y is bigger, I don't care either, actually. Okay? The only thing I care about is that I want this attacker to succeed when I feed him the right Kolmogorov complexity on index i. Now, intuitively, since a succeeds with very high probability, it needs to succeed basically on all the i's also. Uh, so this should be kind of trivial, even if it doesn't only works with high probability. And not always. Unfortunately, this is wrong, this proof. And the reason it's wrong is that, yes, it works with high probability of i, that's true. But the attacker here, he's only going to actually work when I give him y's that are in the range of this one function. And I need a Kolmogorov complexity uh, uh, problem to be solved on random y. So, in the one year function experiment, A works when the output Y is the output of a random program, but I need it to work when the output is random, when the, oh, sorry, the input to, to this thing is random, Y is random. And these two distributions are very far apart. You know, random programs are not gonna output random strings. Right? So at first we're here like, ah, this approach doesn't work. It seems like it's wrong. However, it turns out that actually using a counting argument, you can prove that even though these distributions are so far apart, we can still make the argument go through. It turns out that they're not that far in relative distance, that's gonna be good enough. So let me actually, you know, in three minutes, give you this argument, at least in a slightly simplified case because the proof is super easy. Okay, so let's assume that we have an attacker A that is deterministic. Okay, it makes it a little bit more messy when it's uh, randomized, but let's just focus on A being deterministic. And as I mentioned, if the attacker uh, A actually succeeds when I feed him the true Kolmogorov complexity, when I feed him I equals KT of Y, then the heuristic will succeed. Right, that's the only thing I care about. Given Y and the actual Kolmogorov complexity uh, I, 
if the attacker succeeds on that, then I know that the heuristic gives the right answer because I don't care what it does on bigger ones because I'm going to output the smallest eye. And I don't care what it does on smaller eyes because I know there is no uh, witness on when I is smaller. So the only thing I care about is what happens when I given the right cohomological complexity as input. When I is the actual cohomological complexity. All right, so consider some attacker uh, A and consider some string Y on which the heuristic fails. And my goal is to show that the number of such strings here is small. Here, what's the probability this Y is sampled here? It's two to the minus N because it's uniform. Okay, all strings are sampled probability two to the minus N. So probability two to the minus N, I get a string here and I, I pick a string on which the heuristic fails. What I would like to argue is in fact that this string Y needs to happen here with pretty much similar probability. So if H of Y failed, it must be the case that A given the true Kolmorgan complexity W and Y fails also. But what's the probability that this W and Y are sampled in this one function experiment? Okay, what's the probability this I is gonna be the Kolmorgan complexity? Well, that is just one over N roughly. What's the probability that Y is sampled here? Okay, that is maybe a little bit tricky, you think, at first, but it's not so bad because the Kolmogorov complexity of Y is W. So with probability two to the minus W, I'm gonna actually pick that program, right? There exists a program of length W. So with probability two to the minus W, I pick the program, right? And I know that the Kolmogorov complexity is never much more than N. So two to the minus W is never more than two to the minus M plus C. So therefore I know that the prob this pair W comma I is sampled in this experiment with probability uh, roughly two to the minus N, two to the minus N divided by N. So for every string on which this guy fails, I have a string here that is sampled with roughly same probability on which the, uh, the one in function, uh, inverter fails. And therefore we conclude since here, I know that he's actually succeeding with high probability, he must succeed with high probability here also. So yeah, because I'm here looking at exactly this uh, W, like I don't know, maybe one could actually uh, maybe one, maybe it will still actually work, and you will just lose an extra factor. And yeah, yeah. 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 Well, is it sufficient that like random programs are actually like the top random strength? Because many programs are the Yeah, they're you know they're, they're not like the stati statistical distance are very far apart, but in relative distance they're actually close. Yeah, that's kind of the point. Yeah, that random programs actually output strings that that are random with decent probability, and that's the. All right, so that was like the, the, the first direction, the easy direction. The second direction is to show that you can actually get uh, hardness from 1A functions. I'm basically not gonna go into that, but I'm gonna uh, tell you at least uh, uh, this original proof by uh, uh, Kabaretz and Kai, why, you, why 1A function supplies worst case hardness and tell you why that fails in another setting. So the idea here is that if you have a 1A function, we know you can get using here, you can get a PAG, okay? And uh, PAGs, are strings that are pseudo-random, right? Uh, and uh, and outputs of a pseudo-random generator must have very small cohomological complexity, right? Because it's a small C that's expanded. So the cohomological complexity of pseudo-random strings is small. Random strings, on the other hand, we know have very large cohomological complexity, okay? So if you can compute cohomological complexity, you can clearly tell apart these two worlds and therefore you can break the PAG and therefore you can break the one function. So therefore you have contradicted one functions. So if you can compute common complexity, you can break PAGs and uh, you're done. This argument, however, only works when you have an attacker that computes KT always with probability one. Okay. And why is that? If I just have a heuristic that succeeds with probability one with 99% probability, he might fail on all these things, 
because they're so sparse to their own strengths. So this argument just doesn't work. Make sense? However, we show that you can actually make this argument go through anyways, if you're relying on a better type of PAG, something we call an entropy preserving PAG. So roughly speaking, we want to have a PAG where the, the output of the PAG actually still preserves a lot of entropy of the seed. So it actually doesn't lose too much entropy. Unfortunately, you know, that was the original notion we had. We spent a lot of time on trying to get this. We still couldn't get this in any functions. So then we have to like cripple this notion a little bit into an uglier notion called like conditionally entropy preserving. Uh, so it's roughly this, but where I condition on some additional event, this we could construct from one in functions. And it turns out that this one is enough. Also, I won't go into details. It's in the paper. But yeah, this one you can get the one implementations. It's very easy. So this thing actually like for one implementations, that was actually the first iteration of the paper. We were like, okay, we can't prove, but it's like almost one function. We can one implementation, one direction, but yeah. How the relaxation helps, I'll have to go into details on that. But basically you can kind of, you can view a simplified version of a hill that like some of the initial steps of hill that you can actually show us still and to be preserving, but not pseudo random, uh, can be made to be pseudo random once you do this condition. So you kind of condition on some. Yeah. No, yeah, this thing, the entropy preserving property is the thing that avoids the sparsity problem. I want it to kind of like really need to, uh, yeah. That does help. Yes, exponentially strong when you can get that are uh, here. Yeah. All right, so uh, I don't have much, much time and I wanna cover a lot of other stuff here. So I'm gonna go fast. <clears throat> so to sum up, uh, what we've shown here is that uh, KT uh, characterizes uh, uh, one in function, at least average case and this gives the first natural, natural uh, simple problem to characterize all these uh, mini crypto primitives. You can also state this equivalence in terms of a, a language. So there's a decisional problem called the MKTP problem. Uh, that talks about uh, deciding whether Kolmogon complexity is larger or smaller than a certain threshold. So if you set the threshold to be roughly n minus log n, uh, uh, that also characterizes one in functions. So the same proof directly uh, shows that. And so, you know, informally, the way you want to interpret it is that crypt is possible if only it's, it's hard to find patterns in, in random strings. Or can you figure out if this random string has some patterns or not? All right, uh, in the last five minutes, I'm going to go back to the holy grail here that we had. Diffie Hellman's thing, can we base script on MP dot equal to P? The answer is that we should be able to do this. And uh, maybe, you know, not in the next 10 years, but we will be able to do this eventually. Okay, so uh, although we have this like partial black box separations, I would not be discouraged. I think this is a very worthwhile problem to, to work on, and eventually people will do this. <laughs> so let's see how we can interpret our results as like shedding new light on this question. Okay. So the first observation is the result we just mentioned now, actually only tell us something about this question. Turns out that, so we showed uh, one function equivalent to this MKTP problem, deciding whether convolutional complex is smaller, smaller or larger than this threshold. And uh, if you could just you now show a worst case to average case reduction for this problem, and also show that this problem is empty complete, then you're done. There's those two little steps. Show this empty complete and do a worst case to average case reduction. Not so much, we're used to doing this. People do it for lattices all the time. At least one of them. <laughs> okay, even those sometimes, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, let me just point out that this is exactly what you need to do. Because if you can base one in functions MP not equal to P, then you know that if you can break one in functions, you can solve MP. So therefore the other direction like follows. So this is, it really is the minimal thing you need to do. You need to prove these two things. So this only gives you some kind of characterizations of what you need to do. Just do average case hardness and prove worst. Uh, and you know, there's been some great progress actually on this. Uh, in fact, in 2018, uh, Hirahara showed the worst case average case reduction for this. Only one little issue, he didn't get the same type of average case hardness that we want. We want kind of the, the stronger notion of average case hardness, something called two-sided error average case hardness, whereas he only gets something called errorless average case hardness. Let me not go into details of that, but they are separate these notions. 
Uh, all right, so maybe then we can overcome that. The second thing is proving NP completeness of that. That is maybe a little bit trickier. In fact, the mythology, uh, according to the mythology, um, at least, a cosmographer asked Levin to prove this. It was like, you know, before you finish your thesis, you better show that this problem actually is empty complete. Because all this whole empty completeness theory seems pretty silly. Like, you know, at least prove a real problem is empty complete, like this thing. And so, yeah, apparently he delayed publication of his thesis for a while to uh, to try to prove empty complete as this, and it's still open. Eventually, he gave up. Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, yeah. No, it is. It is important here, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe. Let me see. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let me quickly sum up here There's a few more. Um, so this is harder to do, but actually in recent years, there's been some progress on this. In fact, Ilango showed that some closely related thing called Oracle MCSP is MP complete. So what we did in a, in a paper that's coming up in CCC now uh, is uh, we, may, we changed the problem a little bit and add a little C here, okay? Once you add a little C here, then you get something that is MP complete. So what is this C problem? It's something called the conditional convergent complexity problem, which actually is sometimes we studied uh, also since the at least 70s, okay? Uh, so the, the problem here is given X and some Z, what is the shortest program that outputs X given Z for free? Okay, you get the axis Z. There's a small caveat, we consider RAM programs. Originally, they defined it for Turing machines, but I don't think that's a really major thing. So this problem turns out to be MP-complete, and it's still the case that this is equivalent. Average case hardness of this is equivalent to 1A functions. So therefore, really, if you want to base 1A functions on MP not equal to P, the exact thing you need to do is to prove a worst case average case reduction for this problem. Uh, you can now take it even further and say like, you know, let's go beyond the holy grail. And uh, can we base one in functions on X not inside BPP? That's an even weaker assumption of MP not equal to uh, MP not inside BPP. Three minutes, okay. Uh, and uh, yes. Uh, and uh, so it turns out that actually when you switch to, uh, when you switch to this question, it becomes almost easier. It's kind of surprising. It seems like a harder question. It seems to be getting even closer. It turns out that there is this other problem. When you switch the big T to a little t, uh, then that problem is actually X complete. It's like not only just X complete, it's <laughs> average case complete for X, at least in this errorless notion. Yet, uh, if you have average case hardness for two-sided error, then it's equivalent to one functions. So what is this? MKTP problem, I don't really have that much time to get into it now, but this is actually, to answer your question from before of why, you know, it's very program uh, machine dependent. Levin really didn't like this MKTP problem. And he said, we need to define things differently. The problem here is that we cannot have a, like a fixed time bound T because it's very machine dependent. You change from T to 2T uh, and now everything changes. That doesn't make any sense. So he said, what we should look at is that is a notion where I'm going to look at I'm going to charge for size and running time. And what he said was charge logarithmic if running time. And that's this MKTP problem that he defined in the 70s. Turns out that the MKTP problem no longer is an NP, but rather is X complete. Uh, and, uh, and so what we showed this actually is not only X complete, but it's also average case complete for X, this problem. So, uh, the only thing that remains now for basing one in functions on X not equal to BPP is doing two-sided error to errorless, uh, a reduction from two-sided error to errorless uh, heuristics for this particular problem. Uh, and I should point out that in fact, one direction of this was independently shown by Ren and Santanam. 
Uh, there is, in the last year, or uh, has been a lot of other uh, uh, really cool work uh, uh, connecting one-way functions and, uh, and cryptography, and uh, I'm expecting there will be a lot more. It seems to be like really a, a golden time for uh, connecting cryptography and cosmological complexity. Uh, one, one more result I just wanted to mention here is in last year's uh, stock, uh, what we showed was that, in fact, you don't need to assume even polynomial time hardness of this problem, it's enough to actually assume that the problem is hard for sublinear time, for n to epsilon time, and that is good enough to get one in functions. You need to change the problem now to, in fact, to not consider a big threshold, t minus n minus log n, but when the threshold is a little bit smaller, that's when it starts to suffice. And actually this result, to go back to this title side of match made in heaven, this result made us think that something is like this. It really is like this cryptography and, and cosmological complexity were developed together by somebody up there. Because what happened here is that this threshold, when you make the threshold smaller, you get a stronger one in function. So when a threshold is polylog, this problem characterizes sub exponentially secure one in functions. When a threshold is something a little bit bigger, you get quasi polynomial. you get a smooth trade-off. So the threshold of this MKTP problem, it's really like this problem was like tailored to exactly capture quantitative hardness of one in functions. As far as I know, this is the only problem that like where changing the threshold actually changes quantitative hardness of something. You can actually prove that it becomes harder. And so an intriguing consequence of this is that using cryptography now, using this whole PAG construction we're going through, if you don't care about crypto at all, it shows that MKTP has that problem, property, that changing the threshold makes the problems quantitatively actually harder. You can, you can conjecture, can you prove it? Here, here you prove that if you have like, uh, like if you can break this with a certain uh, probability, then you can break that one with, uh, with a bigger, it's a running time, right? It's a running time. It's not probabilities. Right, this is like intuitive. We would like to show these type of things in crypto all the time and say, uh, iterate a function many times that will make it you know, harder uh, to, it handles, uh, yeah, it requires bigger size to invert. We have no idea of proving these type of things, but here, we can actually show it because we have this connection to the, this problem that's so structured. Uh, another really cool thing I want to mention is this work by Ren and Santanam. Uh, so there's a third notion of cosmological complexity out there. When, uh, uh, when you do something at Levin, when you want to also charge for running time, but instead of charging logarithmically, you charge linearly for running time. And it wasn't really clear to how these notions relate. So what they show is that if you consider that problem instead, you still characterize cryptography, but not general one in functions, but rather one in functions in NC0. So that problem actually, you know, characterizes a subclass of one in functions instead. Very cool work. So cryptography really gives a new lens to look at these problems in meta complexity, and they seem to characterize different types of, of one in functions. So the conclusion here is that you know, computational cryptography really is very intimately tied to some of the most basic notions in algorithmic information theory. So whenever you do computational cryptography, you're also actually doing algorithmic information theory. And cryptographic techniques can provide insight into long-standing open crypt problems in, uh, in that area and vice versa. Like we could actually, by using the structure of, MKT, of this MKTP problem, get this type of hardness magnification results for cryptography. Open problems are uh, get a truly practical one-in function. The real bottleneck here is that we need to go from a weak one-in function to a strong one-in function. That kills all practical efficiency. That's horrible. So can we directly get a direct construction of a strong one-in function? That's a great open problem. And can we do the same thing for more advanced primitives? Thank you. Thank you.